It's Richard Edelman. I'm here to unveil our third trusted work study. I'm joined by Alex Thompson, who runs our flipper practice, and Sidney Roach, who runs our employee experience practice. We're seeing a rise of spines, unionization, a question about return to the workplace, a whole reevaluation of whether or not um, we are appropriately balancing work life. So today I'm going to unveil the results of our study. Um, which has been done across uh, seven countries across the world, almost 7,000 respondents. So here is a construct of the sort of three or four years of findings. The employer became the most trusted institution just before the pandemic. Why? Because trust is local. Then we saw that, in fact, the employer response to the pandemic was absolutely critical to reestablishment of trust. In 2021, we saw the rise of the belief-driven employee, a person chose an employer based on values and beliefs. We began to see last summer that Gen Z is redefining the workplace, uh, in particular, wanting a more work-life balance. Last September, our big finding was the workplace is the island of civility. It is the crucible in which people actually feel comfortable discussing societal issues. Traditionally, it was your neighborhood or the bar or whatever. Not anymore. Today, we are introducing a study called The Workplace Reconsidered. We have to reconsider what the workplace actually means to the employee. Four or five key findings in that. Let's get first to the big one, which is an employer now faces a huge cascade of expectations. Why is that? Well, let's start out with reality that people are more afraid this year. Even though unemployment is at historically low levels, we saw a jump in concern about automation, trade conflicts of the like, biggest increases in Japan and in Germany. We also see a massive trust gap between trust in my employer and trust in the other four institutions, business, government, NGOs, and media. That 23-point gap is the largest one we've ever seen. It gets even more clear in going to this slide. Look where my employer stands on a chart, a two-by-two two of competence on the X and ethical on the Y axis. In fact, versus government, my employer is 60 points higher for competence and ethics versus business, probably tw about 20 to 25 points higher. In short, we rely on my employer because that employer will get things done. Also, there is a absolute conviction that comes out of the pandemic that the communications that comes from my employer. So my employer newsletter is the most credible source of information. Why? Because it's not seen as having an ideological agenda, more than government, more than media, and much more than social media. Also, there is a continued push by job seekers to have CEOs speak up on issues. Now, I want to point out that the U.S. is minus 10 on this. It is minus 10 because Republicans and independents no longer want CEOs to speak out on controversial issues. They do want the companies to act, but they don't want the CEOs to be publicly advocating. In other countries, particularly in the developing world, note the role of the CEO in having to speak out, whether it's on sustainability or inclusion. The expectations for the employer continue to grow. Of course, I want the employer to advance my career, give me a better pay, et cetera. But now I want personal empowerment. I expect to be heard. I want my CEO to listen to me as well as talking to me. I want truthful information. I want personal empowerment. But I also now want societal impact. and. That, that is the three musketeers. And the societal impact is, does the company reflect my value? Does it have greater purpose? Do I have meaningful work that allows me to make change? Also, critical to this study 
Two thirds of employees now want a work life reset. In fact, I'm reevaluating how I spend my time. My employer needs to rethink what work means to me. This is very Gen Z. My friend Sydney will get into this shortly. Thank you so much, Richard. Yes, as you heard at the top of this presentation, and again, just now with Richard, Gen Z is a primary mover behind so many shifts in the workplace. Next slide, please, slide 13. According to our respondents, a whopping 93% of them, Gen Z, is shaping a broad range of factors in how colleagues of all generations think newly about work, from the boundaries we set between work and life, uh, what they consider to be fair pay, to how much we advocate for ourselves at work. They're even influencing the extent to which uh, work shapes our identity. Next slide. As you can see here, younger generations are most likely to bring societal and political issues into the workplace. Two thirds of Gen Z and millennial respondents tell us that they frequently talk about these issues and all the issues of the day at work. Meanwhile, nearly half of Gen Z say they are regularly so overwhelmed by what's happening in the news that they can't function at work. Next slide. It's important to note that young coworkers are also shaping how willing we are to voice our concerns and how open we are to unions or labor organization. If you reflect on some of the most visible labor union movements around the world, this genesis was with younger workers who simply started by convening their colleagues to consider workplace issues in a different light. And remember that um, convening uh, is really a Gen Z superpower. So research tells us they have a proclivity and a desire to unite for change. Next slide. Impact is a deal breaker. What do we mean by that? Three quarters of our respondents say that when considering a job, they want to shape the future in a meaningful way. So tying work to societal impact is a motivation and now an expectation of today's employee. Companies embarking on really large scale workplace transformation should maybe take care to frame their changes in this context if they can do it authentically. Next slide. As mentioned in summarizing this multi-year trend line uh, Richard did at the top of this presentation, your workplace doesn't, your workforce doesn't just want a voice, they want influence. Next slide. In the past year, we've seen a five-point increase in the belief that a large group of employees exerting pressure can get their organization to change almost anything about itself and the largest increases are amongst millennials and Gen X. Next slide. The shape of what that push looks like is changing, however. Overall, employees say they're much more likely to work within the system to accomplish change with a four point dip, however, in their willingness to take their effort public in the form of whistleblowing or protesting or leaking documents. But there's a nuance on the next slide. On closer examination of the data, the story becomes, yes, more nuanced. If we look at the general generational differences, half of our Gen Z respondents are willing to go public. So one in two are willing to take their grievances public if at first they don't get results from working inside the organization. So whilst other generations are moving fast to work within the system, Gen Z still is very divided and willing to take it public. Next slide. Our respondents with a surge again in Gen Z are telling us that they're sharing news coverage of their employers on social media at least once a week. And what's more, they're also posting their own content that they've created online on their social at the same rate. So take note, leverage this group as advocates and watch their posts as a sentiment check. Next slide. Yet despite this upswelling of influence, the infrastructure isn't often in place to raise worker knowledge and sentiment to management levels. You can see the difference in the dark bar and the lighter gray bar here, that that is an expectation gap. 
these expectations are falling short of reality. So for both the ease of contributing input, as well as the degree to which employees are feeling included in the strategic planning process. Next slide. The deskless worker. This was a lot. We did a large oversample of deskless workers as we did with Gen Z. And we find that the deskless worker is feeling left behind. They feel apart as if they're in a two tier organization. Next slide. So in this analysis, we investigated three groups of workers. There's the deskless who don't work in an office, can't work remotely and hold non-executive titles. So these could be delivery drivers, grocery store clerks. It could be people on the floor in a hospital or a medical center. It could be folks who are of course on a manufacturing floor or a retail. Mm -hmm. Then there are desk workers who work in an office and have the option to work remotely. And then finally, there are executives who range from executive director to CEO. And as you can see on the left-hand slide, while deskless workers do trust their employers, they are much less trusting of institutions. Mm -hmm. And this suggests a vulnerable status. They really feel at the periphery of their organization and they feel distant from even societal institutions. Next slide, please. What we see is the deskless employee living in a different world from headquarters or those bound at their desk. They're much less likely, for example, to see progress on climate or DEI issues, for example. On the next slide, we also see that these workers are much less enthused about how their employers are getting involved in social issues or in politics. Next slide. They also feel like their well being is less protected by their employer. And just four in 10 deskless workers say that their workplace takes burnout seriously compared to seven in 10 of executives, for example. Next slide. So, what's leading to this feeling of separateness, of feeling left behind as a, in a two tier sort of organization? Further analysis tells us a crucial difference. If these employees feel trusted by the corporate leadership, they're much more likely to place their trust in the higher ups in an organization. We learned last year in our trust barometer research that trust is reciprocal, but in the workplace, it really relies on the employee feeling that the uh, employer is demonstrating trust in them first proactively. But look at the dramatic difference here in the deskless worker in employee trust levels when they feel that their executives don't trust them. I'm gonna turn it over now to Alex um, and he will introduce himself, which I realize I forgot to do. I'm the global chair of employee experience. Alex? Thanks, Vinny. Um, so just a brief uh, thank you. So I run our global corporate affairs practice and also our global impact practices. And it's great to be back after 10 years away from Edelman. Um, I've just held two roles, one in a consumer facing organization, REI, very US based, and then more recently as CCO of Thomson Reuters, a business to business organization. And the content in this presentation uh, couldn't be more relevant to people who are sitting in the seat deciding not just what do we understand about the employee, but what do we want to do? How can we lead our teams? How can we drive action? Because we know action drives trust and trust drives growth. Next slide, please. So the question, at least in my experience, that all top team leaders are asking of themselves and of their teams is, what does it take to recruit a new amazing employee? What does it take to keep an amazing employee? And the data here is fascinating. So. What you're seeing on this slide is more action persuades people to come to your company or to stay and by a huge margin. So the black um, bar chart here uh, against human rights, for example, is showing they're 14.5 times more likely to choose to come to your organization um, than if you if you have a strong position, you take action on this issue than if you don't. And only five percent. Um, would be less persuaded. And you can see across this slide that human rights, healthcare access, climate change, these issues continue to be really important, but, but employees want to see change. They want to see behavior happening, not just words. Next slide, please. For those uh, who are 
thinking about this from a global perspective, the data in the presentation today is, of course, largely global. This is a zoom in on the US because um, so many folks are interested in the US situation right now. So what we're looking at here is the degree to which engagement and action on particular parts of what we can think of as a brand or purpose or employee engagement agenda would be more likely to be a deal breaker, right? If we don't do this, I won't work for this company. If we do do this, this makes me want to stay. And what we can see is that greater purpose, embodying the, seat, the, the organization's values and diversity appeal across the political spectrum. Now, the red and green dots re relate to either, if it's green, it's over 60%. If it's red, it's less than 50%. We can see, of course, Republicans and independents, less than 50% uh, likely for this to be a deal breaker one way or the other. But nonetheless, it reinforces the importance of doing this work thoughtfully and really well. Next slide, please. Uh, so for those whose work it is to think about how we take insight into action, you know, might be sitting here saying, right, what can we do? And what you're seeing here is a, a cut of a number of options when we think about designing an infrastructure of communication that would build a healthier workplace. So there are a number of questions that were offered, but you can see that 78% of those who were surveyed would be, would be thinking that a formal mechanism to talk about my issues would be effective, a good way to build a healthy workplace. 70%, 77% looking at how do we create a team that represents all employee levels? And interestingly, what does it look like to have an, a stakeholder council? 71% saying a stakeholder council that includes union leaders, executive clients, and employees uh, would be an effective mechanism to build employee influence. That's, that's a big number. Next slide, please. And the, to reinforce Sydney's points on the deskless employee, I, I mean, I think a lot of us know this intuitively, but getting up and being out there and demonstrating, you know, not just what the staff are saying, but also how they do their work. What does it mean to operate in their roles is critically important. So feeling that your CEO not only understands academically what you do, but experiences my day-to-day -day work is the number one thing that is likely to make you feel as though your perspective is being incorporated in decision-making. And I think we all know that these things matter, but actually doing them takes a lot of effort. This reinforces the case um, that our CEOs and our leadership teams should be out there on the, on the floor, um, working with and understanding exactly what's going on. Next slide, please. So a real snapshot of a playbook. Um, what, what does it mean with deskless workers to actually engage? What's going to be effective? And this nine box essentially says um, that if you feel as though your boss uh, or supervisor um, is the most trusted voice, um, then that's the person you need to engage with. What's the top source of communication for a deskless worker? Personal communication from your manager. And what's the top way to make me feel like I have influence? Again, that my CEO experiences my day-to-day -day work. So we need to be thinking about new ways to reinforce that degree of empathy. Richard, I think we're handing over to you for the conclusion. Okay. So we've told you a lot today about the deskless worker uh, and the trust divide. We've told you about the Gen Z uh, input to all of this. But I want to start out with the premise that the high level of trust in employers is bringing responsibility, but also expectation. And I know that there's been a lot of pushback on CEOs in the last months about ESG, for example, this, oh, you're too woke um, by pension funds and others um, saying, you know, I'm the state of Texas, you better not, you know, use ESG metrics. Stand your ground, stand your ground because the employees matter the most. And your consumers matter second most, and your shareholders will follow. You need, however, to pick your battles and pick your issues. And I think you need to focus on your core competences and what your corporate values are. And if you have that cross-section, you'll be fine. 
Now, as for the power of Gen Z, I have one of those in my family, Amanda, uh, and you know she's leading our Gen Z lab, and I hear from her rather frequently. They need to know that they're making an impact. They need to be heard, and we need to do reverse mentoring. I can tell you from my own experience, um, I had an interview. Um, some of my Gen Z didn't like what I had to say. I had a 12-person lunch, and they said what they had to say, and I improved from that. So reverse mentor. Um, three. Prioritize the deskless employees. This is absolutely a time when this is partly the mass class divide, but it's also one of frustration. You know, I don't have as much access to the boss. They don't see what my job is. Do what Laxman Narasimhan of Starbucks did. Go to the restaurants, do the job, put the green apron on and understand what the day-to-day -day work is like. And maybe you'll see that the refrigerators aren't good enough or whatever it is. And you can make the changes based on what you see and can do. Lastly, make sure that you align your actions across the enterprise. It is more and more difficult to do this because of nationalism. I get it. China's pulling in one direction. America's pulling in another. There has to be a universality of, of, of values. You know, for example, there cannot be Me Too behavior. It's not acceptable anywhere. I don't care where it is in the world. You need to be known as zero tolerance on something like this. And your talent strategy needs to be universal. Um, the best and the brightest need to be able to get ahead. But most of all, it's got to be what you do and not what you say. Action earns trust. Okay, so on to the panel, because now we actually have a chance for the experts to critique our work. Isabel. Richard, thanks so much to Richard, Sydney, and Alex for that. My name's Isabel Berwick. I host the FT's Working It podcast about the modern workplace, and I'm delighted to be hosting this panel today to talk about some of the themes that have come up in this survey. And I'm going to introduce the panel first. Our Gen Z panelist is Megan Loist. She's the founder and CEO of Gen Z VCs. It's the largest community for Gen Z innovators in tech and venture capital with over 26,000 members in 80 countries. She was the youngest and first Gen Z investor at Lera Hippo, featured in the 2022 Forbes 30 under 30 venture capitalist list, and now supports Fortune 500 companies and startups on Gen Z innovation and marketing strategies. She's earned herself the title of Queen of Gen Z VC. I like that. Megan, Megan, thanks for joining us. Thank you again. Judy Samuelson is the founder and executive director of the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program and a vice president at the Aspen Institute. I'm sure Judy will be familiar to some people on this call. She's the author of a book entitled The Six New Rules of Business, Creating Real Value in a Changing World. And it describes the profound shifts in attitudes and mindsets that are redefining our ideas about what constitutes business success. She's convened leaders in a multi-year dialogue to produce the Aspen principles of long-term value creation. Judy, welcome to the panel. Dr. Janssen Yap is joining us from Singapore, I believe, where it's almost bedtime, so thank you so much. He's held a dual track career in corporate industries and professional, professional services, and is currently the Chief People Officer for the National University of Singapore. He's the author of several books, most recently, Why Me? Motivations and Expectations of the Worker in a Wicked World, and it's a reflection of a post-COVID world and the impact on the workplace, work and worker. Welcome, Janssen. And last, but certainly not least, is Judy Zabranik. In her role as the Global Head of Organisational Effectiveness, Culture and Change Management at RTX, the company formerly known as Raytheon, she's driving the company's efforts in organisation and assessment, organisational design, high performing teams, executive leader integrations and change management. Judy's also a charter member of the Trust Forum for the Worker Voice, which is a collaboration between the Aspen Institute and Edelman's employee experience. That's our panel today, but we also want to include all of you on the stream. So please submit your questions. There's a form below the live stream. We will filter them. I'm gonna start off by asking the panel questions, but we want to bring in as many of you as we can and make this as flexible as possible. So do join us. So 
I'm going to start off with you, Megan, with the slide that I found the most compelling, that 93% of respondents of all age demographics, you know, tell us that 20-somethings are heavily influencing all their ideas at work, you know, from work-life boundaries, self-advocacy, fair pay, all sorts of things. You know, from where you sit as a, a prominent member of Gen Z, what what should employers do with that information? It, it's a lot. Yeah, I think I think the first thing is is both creating forums so people can actually voice their opinions and building community around that and then empowering them to be able to act. And so I think obviously there's a lot of trust in Gen Z sort of with these types of things because Gen Z has been primed to speak out about their experiences, right? So when it comes to the workforce, our introduction to the workforce was very different from previous generations. Many of us started working max four years ago uh, during COVID, right? And so like I was only working in the office five days a week for six months before I was forced to work remotely. I joined a new job entirely remotely. It took me a year to meet my team. And so the way that I work and was introduced to the workforce looks very different uh, than other generations. And so we talk about that. We have conversations about that. Uh, and I think the other thing too is we're primed to disrupt the status quo. Like when you think about Gen Z, that's one of the biggest buzzwords that comes up uh, in many conversations. And so we're naturally used to going to one another, talking about the differences that we're seeing, and then sharing them on socials, sharing them with one another online, especially, right? And so you see these sort of movements be created. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the things that we're voicing have not been present with prior generations. They just haven't been encouraged to really speak up about them, right? So like, I think you can see a really big difference, for example, even in the past 10, 15 years, millennial social media managers take a very different approach with how they represent their brands versus Gen Z social media managers who are encouraged to take risk, right? And so you want to create, uh, this is trust at work. How do you create an environment of trust? You create forums where everyone feels encouraged to speak. It's great if Gen Z is starting the conversation, but you want everyone to feel really bought in that they can affect change as well. Uh, and so, yeah, creating those forums, but also being able to act on them as well. So maybe you know, diversity could be a thing, sustainability. Is there an opportunity where you're hearing something over and over again from a pattern matching perspective to then enable those people to build something? They'll have so much more affinity for the organization, trust in the executive teams because you're acting in addition to listening. So that would be my advice. Megan, that's great. Thanks so much. What a great way to start. And I I wanted to bring in Judy Samuelson here because you've written a book that describes the profound shifts in attitudes that are redefining our notions of what business success means. But how do these findings about the shifts in the, the meaning of work you know, fit into, you know, that redefined notion of business success as you see it? Well, thanks so much for the chance to be talking about this. I love this research. I think it's profound. I think it's giving us insight that is critically important in the in kind of business governance and, and management. Um, you know, it, it, the word mindset, yeah, it is, it's a shift in mindset. We saw this coming. We knew that, you know, if you, one of the things I write about is, is essentially the, the importance of employees, both as change agents, but also as kind of a, the connectors between the inside of corporations and how they make decision and these profound shifts that we're all experiencing in the wider world. And so, you know, our work is about aligning business decision making with the long term health of the commons. We believe in business as, as an critically important piece of this whole puzzle. And I believe, and I think that what this research helps us better understand, is that it's the employee in all of the ways in which Sydney and, and Richard and, and, and Alex have talked about it. It's the employees that are kind of the most important piece of that. I believe more important than consumers as the driver of change or as investors who want lots of different things and come in different shapes and sizes. You know, employees are not, I don't like the word stakeholder. They're not a stakeholder. They are the enterprise. And I hope, I think this signals a profound shift in kind of the power balance in some respects. We'll, we'll open ourselves up, I believe, as, as Edelman's work in this on worker voice has helped us realize new ways of thinking about how to engage employees. I love Richard's list of things that executives can be doing differently. But I, I want to make sure that we also are remembering that this isn't just about 
companies remembering that this is, you know, access to talent is a competitive advantage. That's kind of the language I think that brought us into this space. But it's really a moment to step back and say, what is it that employees bring to the table? They not only connect the inside and the outside, and this Gen Z work really amplifies this sensitivity that a generation has and expects to resolve in the workplace. But they're the eyes and ears to the consumer. They're, they're the ones managing the supply chain and can anticipate and amplify the risks that business needs to be um, aware of. But they're also a link to opportunity. I think employees see the opportunity in sustainability and in managing an inclusive workplace. And so I think this is an important signal. I'm delighted to to be able to better understand where this can take us. Thanks very much, Judy. And, and you know, obviously staying with the employee perspective, I wanted to bring in Janssen here. You know, in markets, and some of our viewers will be in those markets where much of business and society is, shall we say, government sponsored. Do you find employees seek the same sort of influence as in other countries? You know, how, how, how does it look where you are? Well, uh, I live in Singapore and I work around Asia. And in a lot of instances, I think as we look at the people coming into the workforce, uh, and especially in the university uh, that I represent, a lot of the workforce people coming into the workforce feel that they are very unprepared, uh, even though with all the training that they got from the university. And when I ran a survey last year over ASEAN, uh, they were particularly uh, concerned about joining the workforce, unprepared to solve real world problems, despite the technical training. Uh, they were also equally concerned uh, whether they are digitally savvy enough uh, to face the kind of the work that they have to employ, particularly around analytics and so on. So in Asia, uh, where the graduates are coming into the from the university into the workplace, they come with a lot of concerns um, and whether they actually can find jobs. In China, we kind of have about 11.6 million graduates and there's not enough jobs at the moment to accommodate such a workforce. So there's a lot of anxiety about jobs and there's a lot of anxiety about coming into the workforce, particularly all these Gen Z that are graduating from the university. The other reality that we are seeing is that the people are actually peaking in the career much earlier by as much as 10 years, where they would peak in, say, around about 40s, they're now peaking in their late 30s. But at the same time, with retirement age being extended, they find themselves actually in a conundrum that they are working longer and whatever that they have learned over the past time is actually not enough to actually fill the gap between peaking earlier and retiring later. And that is a lot of stress in society where I am. And uh, these are some of the challenges that we see that we really have to address. So the, the quantity of people who are in their 40s and 50s who are underemployed is a big and growing problem. And the other problem that we are seeing is some of these have reduced their expectations so much that they kind of resign their fate into a situation of saying, well, I can't do anything about it. Although a lot of people have been talking about reskilling and changing their skill set or looking for something else, but the opportunity cost to do any of this actually cannot be explored because I might as well just expect lower live simpler and get on with life. So there are a lot of tensions in the whole workforce that I see uh, around the region where I live. Johnson, thank you. That's a wonderful perspective. And Judy Z, I was very taken by the slides on deskless workers. You've got a lot of deskless workers in your organization. You know, could you tell us a bit about you know how RTX is creating ways for that worker voice to be heard? You know, what's your reaction to the slides we've seen? 
Sure, thanks for the question. Raytheon Technologies, we have 180,000 employees worldwide, $67 billion in revenue. So we have a lot of worker voices that we want to hear from, and in particular, our deskless workers, because we know it's harder for them maybe to have access to have their voice heard. So we've made a concerted effort to um, implement six enterprise listening channels, plus each business has two to four local business channels in addition to the enterprise channels. So, and we've tied all of our listening to what we call not our nine moments that matter, right? So we ask very specific targeted questions to what we have researched and found are the most important issues to our employees. And we ask all of our questions around that. In particular for our deskless workers, we know that they may not always have access to a computer, to a laptop, to take surveys, right? They may be working in a manufacturing environment and they're not at a desk. So one of the things that we've done is worked with our site leaders and we've put up um, QR codes where you can go by even with your personal phone device, scan the QR code and take a survey. We also keep our surveys very, very short no more than 10 questions. But again, they're very targeted, very specific questions. And so quick on a break, you can scan the QR code really quick, five minutes or less, you can respond. We also ensure confidentiality in our surveys, yet we also have the ability to slice and dice our data by demographics. And one of our demographics is our production and our manufacturing environment. In particular, our, CHO, our CHRO, Every survey cycle, every engagement survey cycle asks for data specific to that population because we know they're, they have the least amount of access and the, perhaps the least amount of voice, if you will. So we make sure that we're getting that, hand, that data into the hands of the senior leadership. Um, we also put data in the hands of local managers. So we, every leader who has five respondents responding to quantitative questions and at least 10 respondents responding to qualitative uh, questions, they get data. Every manager will get that data. And what we do is say, take that data, have a discussion with your team and take one action. One more, you know, more is great, but one, we emphasize just one thing and that's building trust, right? Like where we heard you, we hear you, let's talk about it, and we're taking action. So we're closing the loop. One of the other channels that we leverage are focus groups. So in addition to our surveys, which we have you know, candidate surveys when you're looking to, to, to uh, potentially come to our company, we have onboarding surveys at various intervals, we have exit surveys, we have engagement surveys, but we also do some higher touch where we have the focus groups and we have one-on-one -on -one interviews. So in particular with our production and manufacturing population, our employee and labor relations team will go in and have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue with our team members to understand what are their issues, what's working, what's not working, where are those opportunities. Also, we have some anonymous channels like um, our ethics hotline, right? Like if you're having an issue, you can call in anonymous, anonymously and we will follow up. Of course, you always have the other high touch avenues like going to your manager directly or to your HR, but we try to ensure multiple channels, multiple vehicles with demonstrated action and demonstrated follow up. Judy, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the first question from the audience now. I'm gonna direct this first to Megan, but then I'd love other, other people to come in. It's clear that engaging the Gen Z employees at a company is critical. Is there a benefit to engaging even younger Gen Z people, teens, college students, etc., who are not current employees, but who will make up the future workforce? If so, are there already mechanisms or processes to do so? Megan, have you heard of anyone doing that? Or oh, you're on mute. Yes. Uh, there we go. Yes, uh, definitely. So I think one really good example actually is NHL's Power Players Initiative, where they bring young fans into the conversation and give them a forum, as we mentioned before, to be able to talk about what does future of fandom look like in the NHL and how can you get involved? It doesn't have to be someone who's college age. It can be much younger, right? Because you can become a fan at any age. I think that same practice can be true across the board. Um, I think about myself, my first uh, internship I ever did was at Citibank as a junior in college because my, I went to a large public high school in New York and uh, 
they prior like Citibank prioritized getting in front of young young people who are interested in business at a very early age. And so like I love to say that my first internship, the first cubicle I ever sat in, my first board meeting, it was at Citibank. And I have really, really positive memories of that and also a relationship with that company. Uh, and but I do think at the end of the day, like that's that stuff I think is extra. Your employees are the most important people that you want to be really sticking around. It's great if you can sort of woo them at the beginning, but you want to make sure that once they're in in the seat, that they're excited to be there every day, to tell everyone about how much they love their jobs, they love their companies, and ultimately be excited to move up. So like Richard mentioned before, reverse mentoring, right? And how important that is. I think my favorite example that I bring up usually is Estee Lauder's reverse mentor program uh, where like they'll bring in young employees at the company that have been there for maybe a year and they're getting FaceTime with the CEO of their organization that they work with to basically share ideas, thoughts on what's happening in their sphere and how that can be relevant. Uh, and so I think that's really important for, for a number of reasons, but you're giving young people like FaceTime, visibility, mentorship, and they get excited about it. And they launched this program in like 2015. So it wasn't something that was unique to Gen Z. And yet eight years later, or, or if I'm doing the math right, but you get the point, like much later, it's becoming even more relevant because it's something that really matters to Gen Z or seeing that impact at scale. So yes, like I could work at Estee Lauder. I can get an employee discount on my favorite lipstick. That's great. But I could also be involved in the strategy of launching a new lipstick line that my mom will love, my sisters will love, that I'll love. You know what I mean? So that impact at scale is so important because I think something else that Gen Z recognizes is that, yes, we all have individual agency, but we're way more powerful as a collective and brands can tap into that in such a huge way. Like I could recycle every day. But if I'm launching a program with Patagonia, who's my employer, that's like creating an entire new recycling program for their millions of customers, ask yourself where you're going to have more impact. And for Gen Z, that really does matter. Thanks, Megan. I'm going to bring Judy in here. I think you've just raised your hand. Judy, yes. Yeah, well, I, I love to hear this. You know, I'm reminded of some of the really felt like soul crushing stories that were happening during COVID, but this image of interns showing up for their summer internship there are no there's no other employees in the room you know they're 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 kind of on ramp uh in kind of zoom land i you know a son of a good friend of mine just spent a year his first year out of college at a professional service firm and never went to a single in-person meeting in his first year on the world you're not going to hang on to that employee so i feel like there's there's kind of a call to action here that this this data is going to invite us to say what do we do to make sure that those first entry experiences i love this idea that there are nine moments that matter i want to find what they all are but one of them has got to be how somebody enters the workforce and whether or not this, in fact, is a, is a team building and a time where we're going to learn as much as we can from this, this employee, as well as know what they can contribute going down the road. Yeah, um, and there's an, another really interesting question here. You know, Gen Z often have a desire to have forums for discussion about social issues and other older generations in the workforce are particularly uh, are potentially more focused on driving results and not taking business time for social or personal or identity topics. Um, Judy Zabrani, do you think that's something that you're finding, that there's a sort of generational divide there? Um, I, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a generational divide. What, what we have found is the issues tend to and I and I think someone spoke to it earlier. the The issues really run across the different generations. It's just that maybe the younger generation is more likely to speak up about it and be more vocal about it. Um, and uh, with regard to Judy Samuelson, um, the nine moments that matter, just uh, this will be a test if I can rattle them off off the top of my head. But we formed our nine moments that matter in question format. Um, so we know these are questions and concerns that that matter to our employees. So, um, and we've aligned them around our aspirational employee experience. So we've put a stake in the ground and said, we want RTX to be a great place to work, 
a great place to grow and a great place to belong. And we've aligned three moments that matter to each of our key pillars. So with regard to work, when an employee uh, joins the company, they want to know what's expected of them. So they walk in the door, right? What do you need me to do? What's expected of me? Then secondarily, they want to know how do I get my job done? What are the tools, the resources, the methodology? Who should I be connecting with? They also want to know once I do a really good job and do my work well, how am I going to be recognized and rewarded for that great work? And then in our grow pillar, we have um, how am I doing, right? You want to know, you want that feedback. All employees want to know it. Are they, are they tracking with those expectations? So they want feedback. They want to grow and develop their skill sets, and they want to advance in their career. So we've aligned those three to our growth pillar. And then from a belonging perspective, they want to know, we, well-being was mentioned. So they want to know, how, do, how can I tend to my well-being? Right. They also want to know, and this is this is exactly what we're talking about. They want to know how is their voice being heard and the voice of others. Do they have those opportunities for their voice to be heard? And then lastly, how do I get connected? How do I get connected to my peers, especially in maybe um, a virtual environment through, as we did throughout the pandemic? How do I get connected to my team, my peers, my colleagues, maybe across businesses, maybe across regions, geography, as well as the communities in which we live, work, and serve, right? So we've aligned those nine moments, and all of our listening is tied to that. So we're really then able to hone in on, uh, we've created a dashboard aligned to those nine moments. And so which which of those nine moments by demographic are flashing, uh, flashing red? Which ones are yellow or cautionary? Like they're not terrible, but there's some opportunity there. And then which ones are we doing really well and we want to keep doing those things? Thanks, Judy. I wanted to bring Jensen in here on that generational piece. You know, I know you're very experienced in HR. Is there a role for HR in reconciling to generational differences or how are you seeing it? So what we are finding uh, is that uh, we are at the cups of a intergenerational change. Uh, we expect that in about 10 years time, uh, where Gen Z workers are representing today at 5%, it will move to about a 30% cohort uh, in about 10 years. And in about 10 years, ASEAN will be the fourth largest economy in the world. And it will have a population of about 700 million people. And urbanization is a key piece of where I think our population stratum will actually be very important. So when we look at that, uh, there are a lot of initiatives around two things. One is we want to maintain a social compact whereby we bring the underprivileged into a more privileged position. So we are beginning to think about, like, for example, if the more well-off people tend to be more prepared to join the workforce in lucrative jobs like the STEM jobs, like medicine and so on, how do we actually help the current underprivileged people to have the same opportunity uh, by giving them extra tuition and extra preparation so that they can compete better. So there's a social compact element in, for us to actually address. So that's one point. I think the second point is uh, we are now having a lot of initiatives around bringing kids to the workplace to see what the moms and dads do at work. And at the same time, we also bring the underprivileged segment of kids into the workplace so that they can get to understand what they watch on television in terms of work versus the reality of work. And we are beginning to do a lot of this. And so in NUS, we actually have an NUS high to prepare students as they go into the university. So the government is encouraging us to actually reach out to the younger secondary schools or the post-primary school kids and to educate them, to inform them, and to inspire them about how work might look like in about 10 years when they're going to join the workforce. So these are the kind of things that we are working on. But at the same time, as we are looking towards the younger part, we are equally focused on helping uh, the older members of the workforce to be able to cope and to be resilient and to actually stay longer in the workforce with meaningful work. And so we have a phrase in, in our university whereby we want our workforce to be their best selves at the best place to work. And that's actually our employee value proposition that we have coined 
uh, for at least for the next few years. Thank you, Janssen. I think this is might be our last question, and it's picking up on the slide that I was interested by. In the US, with both Republican and independence views that they don't want CEOs to take a stand on social or political issues, that represents more than 50% of the US public. Wouldn't it be better for CEOs to focus on what really matters to shareholders rather than take a public stand based on personal beliefs on issues that don't affect their business model? Judy Samuelson, I'm going to come to you first on that, because this is a big question at the moment, isn't it? Uh, yes. Um, and there's no there's no yes or no answer to what's the right thing to do here. Richard touched on this um, and spoke about the kind of importance of this in terms of trust in the CEO and what it is that this generation that we've been talking about, but not just this generation. I believe that this does cross generations that we're trying to understanding this moment. You know, um, there, I don't think the, the CEO doesn't have the luxury of standing down in this moment. And I think what this research takes us back to is how critical it is for employees to understand the connections between the enterprise and the the long-term success of the enterprise and all of these complex questions that are being posed not just in boardrooms but kind of in the civic space about what is business going to stand for how it's going to engage what its role is in addressing existential questions from climate to you know inequality and I believe the CEO who is careful to think through and to lead his or her organization to think about why do they really exist? Why have we granted the license to operate? What does that mean in terms of the connections between this wider world and our business model? And if, if, the, if they're really thoughtful about that, and we're coming out with a piece of work for boards that I, that I hope will be of use in boardrooms, it enables them to think about the connections and what really matters most to the health of the enterprise. And I think an executive who really thinks this through and is leading their organization to create these connections, the solutions are going to come through, through you know, co-optition and co-creation and collaboration. It's not about just the individual enterprise today. The executive is able to think that through is going to be able to speak powerfully to what matters to the shareholder and what matters to import, importantly to the employee and to be able to make those connections, I think is absolutely critical today. It doesn't mean standing down, but it also doesn't mean speaking out on every last issue that might be important to the employees. They can distinguish between what is a, a conversation with employees and when they need to use their voice in a civic, civic sport, uh, more of a civic in, engagement. And we're seeing powerful examples of executives who have figured out how to kind of drive through these two poles. Uh, Richard wants to come in here. So, Judy, I think you're on an important path. A CEO has three choices. You can stick your head down and hope everything passes. You can speak to your own people within your four walls. And then you can be a public advocate on certain set of issues. On choice one, I would say that is not what to do. Um, that, that time has passed because your people need you to speak. The, the, the second option is something that you must do when there are events. For example, a mass shooting in the U.S. or um, something of this ilk that really disturbs everybody. The murder of George Floyd, I, to, 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 to cite one. On the public advocacy, I would again go back to what are the core values of the company? What are the core competencies of the company? Where do you have the right to speak? If you're Unilever and it's about um, how women you know, can go to school, for example, um, with hair or things, they have every right to speak because that's their set of products. In Thailand, women could have to go to school with uh, the square haircut or something and Unilever campaigned against that and very effectively and, and, and engaged the employees in Thailand to speak up. That's perfect. Um, but in this moment of time, the reason this matters is you saw where my employer stands in the chart, top right corner. Everyone is looking to my employer because government is so unable um, and, and incapable, divided, et cetera, 
Um, not everywhere, by the way. In Singapore, you guys do it pretty well. Um, but the reality of the world is, in most cases, people are looking to business because business gets it done. And that's something from the last three years. Business is the most trusted institution. And therefore, we count on you for action and not just flapping your gums. I'm going to take that back from Richard for just a moment now to say thank you so much to all our panelists and to all of you for watching. I'm going to briefly hand back to Richard just for some closing remarks about what the data means for your clients at Edelman. So I, I in a sense, previewed my close, but let me tell you, I, I was at a dinner last night with 30 CMOs hosted by the Wall Street Journal and Susan Branica, who's the you know chief marketing editor, said, you know, do you think this means the end of purpose for brands? Do you think this means that we don't have permission to be activists at all? And I said, no, sorry, quite the contrary. Um, but I think the yellow lines arguably are, are closer in, that you don't have the permission to speak about everything. Um, business has a privileged position in the moment, um, but also great expectations. You know, it's, 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 it's in a certain way as if you're the child who has a lot of potential. <laughs> um, and we do have to pay real attention to this deathless worker. I think that's a genius insight, the, the sort of disaffected nature of, of, of not just the factory floor person, but the delivery person, et cetera. I think the, the Gen Z impact is deeply important. Um, everybody's seen this on brands, but no one has really taken it up in, as a matter for the workplace. And the last is this sort of sorting out of Still, what is the relationship between the employer and the employee about the workplace? You know, it, you know, does everybody have to come to the office five days? Well, that's not going to work in most cases. Um, it, it's going to work best if it's hybrid because that's what people want. Um, at the same time, we have to have a corporate culture that works and we need to pass along our knowledge. And so all of this is in play. And that's why I applaud what Sydney and our uh, trust research team have done, Tony and Dave, um, to give all this data to our clients and, and the broader public, and why we are committed to, as Edelman, continuing to explore issues of trust in society. In fact, the sort of centerpiece of our Davos research is going to be the growing gulf between science and society, between innovation and acceptance uh, across agriculture, energy, tech, and health. So again, we can't have a society that is lagging behind the pace of innovation. If people don't accept change, there's a reason for it. Maybe they don't understand it. Maybe they can't appreciate it. Maybe there's too much misinformation, Isabel, and, and a degradation of, of, of media channels. But anyway, I, I wanna thank everybody for being on the panel. I want to thank everyone for giving us an hour of your time today. Edelman is deeply committed to this subject. We will continue to bring you the best information that we can so you can make proper decisions. Thank you all very much.